Hi everyone, this is your host Susan Telford. I'm happy to be here again with Integrating Spiritual Awakening in Your Everyday Life. And today my guest is Jack O'Keefe. Welcome Jack, it's lovely to have you here. Thank you Susan. For those that don't know Jack, she is a spiritual teacher with a unique style which you're about to find out. Her teachings cultivate wisdom, honesty and integrity and she exposes taboos that are usually avoided in spiritual circles and encourages conversations around issues that are fundamental to our human experience. Jack speaks about the required evolution of both teachers and methods to impart teachings to make spirituality relevant and applicable to regular life. She's written two books, Born to be Free and How to Be a Spiritual Rebel, which I'm currently reading. She's also a founding member of the Association for Spiritual Integrity, an organization that encourages spiritual teachers and the community to support each other in a process of growth and spiritual development. And you can find details of Jack's work in the show notes for this podcast, including a link to her podcast. So Jack, hi, it's lovely to see you. And I think that um, your bio uh, really sets up our conversation because as I said, our topic, my topic on these podcasts is integrating spiritual awakening in everyday life. So um, one of the things I absolutely loved about your website, which I'm just going to read, is the very beginning part. You, you have some little kind of bullet points going across. I don't know what the technical term is. And it says Jack's teaching is about empowering individuals who are done with seeking, done with hiding and done with outsourcing their spiritual awakening to gurus. It's for people who are ready to go to God in their own two shoes. I love that, in their own two shoes. So as an introduction, can you tell us what's your spiritual path been like and how have you come to this understanding? Mm -hmm. You know, there are actually seeds of it when I was 15, Susan. I'm 55 now, so there, that's a while ago. <laughs> um, I remember, you know, I went to a Catholic uh, boarding school in Ireland and I remember in religion class and my teacher was a lay teacher she was a young woman in her late 20s and she was talking to us about sex and contraception and what became clear was I don't think she's had sex I remember thinking I don't think so I asked miss miss but what's sex like? What's it like? And she said, I don't know. I just caught her on the hop and at the top of the class, she said, I don't know, I haven't had sex. I'm a virgin. And a few of us looked at each other and went, oh, holy crap, holy crap. I went to the principal afterwards and I said, like, it, how can we be educated by somebody who doesn't know what's going on? And of course the nun was like, what? Like, she completely put me in my place but there was a little seed germinating in the back of my head. It's like, how can we teach something that we haven't gone through ourselves? And shouldn't she have told us at the get-go, I can tell you this from what I know, and I can tell you this from the experience of others. And that was the point I was trying to make, but of course I hadn't processed it through. I didn't have the vocabulary or the understanding, but something in my 15 year old self knew about authenticity, honesty, transparency, and the importance of being right up there, vulnerable, open, available, clear. And where do those virtues play in now in contemporary spirituality? And I'm doing the same work, like 40 years later, <laughs> I was like, that for me is where the rubber hits the road. That is the integration of spirituality in our everyday life. And 
Traditionally, we, we're not encouraged to be honest on that level. Not, not within the spiritual circles, for sure. And it's only just becoming okay now to, you know, to call things out, to call out, you know, sexual intimidation or or racism or social injustice or it's like I don't want to be spoken to speaking out against bullying or I don't want to be addressed in this way this is not okay this is disrespectful so we're finally beginning to find our voice and so too is spirituality changing to become more honest more transparent more respectful of each other in our humanness and as a result our spiritual wisdom will be much deeper, is deepening and becoming more authentic, like never before. It's an exciting time. So um, tell me about your own journey. When did you come to spirituality? What's, what was your path? Mm. Um, there, there, there are hours and hours of conversations we could have here because, you know, the older I become, the more, the more, um, the more I understand that the nuances are actually more important than the big Eureka awakening story. It's, it's in the little things where the refinement happens that I think the authenticity of any spiritual teacher shines through. Um, most of us have an awakening story that's out there documented somewhere or in our bio or something. And I deliberately removed mine from my website it might go back in again but about two years ago I thought I'm going to take away that awakening story because my awakening story involved going from atheism to my third eye opening in a flash and seeing dead people everywhere and I thought I was having a trip it's like this is an LSD simulated you know experience so who's given me what and of course it wasn't it was my third eye opening it wasn't anything else other than a spiritual awakening um, and the ability to see past lives and see chakras and all these extra perceptions were available instantly. And that was really tough to integrate. I had an option. Do I shut it down or do I investigate more, say yes to this new way of being and experiencing the world? And, and do I find out more and learn how to get a handle on it? And which so I went to that class, which I did. I said yes to it. And I had that choice. Hmm? How did you do that? Did you did you yeah. have a teacher or you know a, a teacher who who is alive and well in the north of Spain? Uh, he's a recluse. I've never physically met him, but he appeared at the bottom of my bed in the middle of the night one week after my third eye opened suddenly, and you know I was just looking at this dude like, "Who are you? Get the f out of my house!" Like it's the middle of the night. My husband was snoring beside me. Thank heaven he didn't hear a tittle. And I was talking out loud to this guy. Um, and as far as I know, he was talking back. But, you know, it's, it's more, I think, that there was a telepathic communication because very often I'd be halfway through a sentence and the answer would come back. And so in that conversation, he told me, I have a choice. You can shut this down or you can you can progress and, and see where this will take you. And I said, what's in it for me? Being my 30 year old, all about me, ego driven self. Well, what do I get if I do take this route? Give me some carrot. And he gave me an experience of love that like was, I don't know, like <sighs> orgasmic at a cellular level multiplied by a thousand kind of thing. They're just an incredible sensation in every cell and he said that's that's unconditional love that's what that frequency is and I went what that's that's love and he said no it's unconditional love I said, oh oh give it to me again give it to me again so that I know what I'm feeling and he gave me the sensation again and I went okay okay that's not like any phenomenal experience at all and he said no it's an entirely different thing and that's a teaspoon and I'm telling you that there is an infinite ocean of this. And you got me. Yes. OK, this is this is undeniably otherworldly. And I, I'm saying yes, whatever you want to do, go for it. And so he told me what to do, you know, very practically. 
don't take, I was a freelance arts consultant at the time, don't take on any new contracts, honor every contract you have within six months time, you'll be working as a ghostbuster within a year of that, it will change and you will no longer work with people who have passed away. That's all he gave me. Okay, I have my marching orders, there we go. And so my life completely changed from there, completely. And I never, ever, ever looked back. Like, never. It was the most important yes ever. Yeah. And so after that, what what did you do after that? Mm. Ghost busting sounds um, interesting, but probably not, <laughs> not that relevant to what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, not really. It was all I could. I we wouldn't go into that one. <laughs> Yeah, it taught me, it taught me that experience of ghost busting taught me how to, how to love people that I didn't know, people that scared me, that were like kind of grotesque physical bodies that were appearing like in front of me, suspended in midair, but in front of me. And it taught me how to access love regardless of what was in front of me. Mm. Hugely valuable, great foundation from the get go. You know, um, you know, then I went on to to it's time to work on the healing and not work to work on the dead. That came a voice in my kitchen one day as I was washing dishes. And I'm like, whoa, oh, there's nobody here. OK, it must be that guy again. Four or five years later, I met that same dude, M- maybe more, maybe seven. Some years later, I met him. Um, at this time, I was living in a healing center with my husband. Um, we were we were we were hosting people who traditionally would be put in a psychiatric hospital, but I knew it was a spiritual awakening, and so they would come and stay with us, um, and w- work with me in order to kind of integrate the spiritual awakening. I was like 35, 37, maybe 36, maybe at this point, integrate the spiritual awakening um, to 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 be able to know that you're not crazy. Know that there is language and there are skills and my spiritual capabilities can be welcomed into my human life are not an obstacle, not a problem. And if I'm not understood by many people, it's okay. As long as I'm understood by one or two, it's okay. Now, you know, that's 20 years ago. So a lot has happened since then. And and we now know, you know, the difference between psychosis and spiritual awakening. Stan Groff, I remember, wrote an incredible book that I leaned heavily on in, in that time. Um, he talked about a medical emergence and a spiritual emergence. Medical emergency, spiritual emergency. Um, and so for us to know the difference. And thankfully now there is so much of an emphasis on mental health and we're taking care of our mental health as much as we're taking care of our physical health, I hope. And so we're better able to navigate. Oh, so changes happen in my brain as I spiritually awaken. Changes happen in my brain. And so how do I manage to get my kids out for school in the morning when at the same time this inner pull that I just want to sit and meditate all day? Or I I, I know that the outside world is showing up to be not real. Like, but how do I function? Because I have dependence. And so more and more this conversation, like what you're offering, Susan, this conversation about how to integrate it in everyday life, we need a lot more information on this, a lot more, because there's still a lot of suffering where people don't know who who can I talk to that can understand this world. So, So this conversation needs to become much more mainstream, and it will, it's getting there, but it's important to to continue to support each other as we we navigate this new terrain of making spirituality integral to our humanness, which of course it is because we're spiritual beings first. We're just having a human experience. But our common understanding is, oh my God, I'm having a spiritual awakening. It's like, no, no, you are a spiritual being. You're just recognizing in your humanness that what you really are is spirit. You see? So even, even the language we use of my spiritual awakening is like, um, you're like you're you're you always were spirit how do you mean you're waking up to that as if it's something new you always were 
you know, and, and you might remember it from your childhood. And how does it show up in your regular life now? Are you spirit or are you just pretending to be a human? The pretense stops. That might be a, another phrase for spiritual awakening. The pretense stopped. You know, when did your pretense stop? You know, and as we look even post awakening, post integration, right through to like levels of, of mastery, right through to like the evolved wise ones who are spiritual leaders for a long time, be they in the body or, or having be, been passed, that vibration is still available to us. You know, the gems that can come to us and somehow we want to frame it as something special. We're gifted or we're an empath, or we have separate skills. Can we turn it right around? Did you awaken to your own spirituality? Or, you know, did you just stop pretending that you were a human being? And still, no matter how advanced we are, where am I still forgetting? Where am I still forgetting that, that I am this divine essence showing up in a human form? Where are my blind spots? And this is the ongoing work that, that, that I like to talk about and mentor and support spiritual teachers to, to um, and, and to have checks and balances for myself as a spiritual teacher, because I've got to be walking my talk. Otherwise, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I get sick. I think I'd get sick if I wasn't doing the work myself. Um, on myself, willing to kind of see my own my own blind spots and screw ups and biases and concepts that haven't been seen through yet, you know, because my personality and my human brain is going to do that. And so that's the integration piece. It happens at every level. It's not just I've had an awakening experience and now I'm I'm integrating. It's like our languaging needs to expand a little bit. You know, where, where are we still pretending to be only human? So let's let's back up a bit because um, people listening may think, but I haven't had I haven't had a spiritual awakening that I even need to integrate. Um, I don't even know what a spiritual awakening is. Mm. And so talk to me a bit about what are the signs of spiritual awakening? Because I think that it's easy to think, you know, I'm going to have an Eckhart Tolle experience or a Byron Katie experience or, or what you've said, you know, some guy at the bottom of the bed, some extraordinary experience, but it's not like that for a lot of people. So speak a bit about what does spiritual awakening actually look like in its more gradual form? Yeah. I do see it as an evolutionary process for it to become a gradual integrate as we go methodology. The, the sunbursts and the explosions and the fireworks is of its time. And I'm part of that old fashioned model. And I love when it's like, yeah, there's this subtle thing. It started by like listening to my intuition and I really follow my intuition. But it's like there's something deeper and sometimes I'm doing something and I'm like, I hadn't planned on doing this. It's not that I'm asleep, but my body is moving. My body is moving in a particular way. I swear my mind was playing catch up and my body was doing it. These kind of things. Mm -hmm. This is spiritual awakening. It's like, yeah, what you really are you're, it, it is moving your body. It's moving your body all the time, except your mind likes to think I'm in control. I have autonomy. I'm doing this. I completely decided what you mean there's something else inside living through this form it's like yeah that's what you really are but the mind wants to be the king so spiritual awakening is when there are these little nuances or big fireworks but I want really want like look for the little ones of where something happens and you know your mind didn't create it something and it's like no I couldn't have imagined that I definitely didn't that idea just came out of the blue when I was thinking nothing, you know, like yeah, I was going for a walk and this idea came in out of the blue. It's like, yeah, it's quite likely that your mind was parked 
and something deeper had an opportunity to arise. It might come as a, an idea for something creative. It might come as an idea in work, or it might come as a taste of peace and calm. And oh, God, everything is connected, isn't it? Just these little insights where the mind notices a wisdom that comes from your deeper beingness. These are awakening experiences. For me, that came when my life had fallen apart outwardly. And this voice came to me that insistently told me there is nothing wrong. There is nothing oh, wrong. There is nothing I love it. wrong. Yeah. I love it. And I thought, what do you mean there's nothing wrong? My life has just completely imploded. Yes. Yeah. So if we have these types of experiences and people listening think, ah, oh, actually, I have, I have felt that. How do we nurture that? What are the next steps to, to really see more, I suppose, allow more of what we actually are to come through? Yes. It goes back to the guy at the, at the foot of my bed. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Mm -hmm. Say yes. And so there's an element of surrender there. Yes. That, that requires us to trust something that we have no, not a lot about. It's extremely intimate. We can't sit down and have a cup of coffee with it. Like what is that core of our being that is much wiser? Can we trust it? Ultimately, we're, we dissolve into it and we realize that my mind is a product of it it turns right around that that's actually what I am. And then I'm playing with this human brain. But while you think you have a human brain and that you are a product of that, of who you think you are, you are who you think you are, as long as that identity is in place, yeah, there is a bowing down, a surrendering, a trust. It's kind of, it's almost devotional in its field, fe feeling, you know, it, 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 it's a precious, intimate thing. So the things not to do, dismiss it. Believe that the mind is, knows more. Shut it off the because you're scared. Try to talk you out of it. The mind will because it doesn't want to surrender because it's all about surviving. It's like, what? I got you here. I'm the one that made you and built you into who you are. What? You mean to say there's a higher power than me inside you? No way. That's the mind's agenda. Well, it, it always, it, it, it's fed with this impulse to survive. It itself wants to survive. And so it's about retraining that mind to like, hey, let's, let's cooperate here. Let's, let, let's see where it guides us. Can we trust? Can we kind of get out of the way? If the mind can get out of the way, it feels like you're kind of get out of your own way. It feels like that. You're in your own way, but really it's your mind is filtering and assessing if your deeper wisdom is accurate. But the thing is, the mind isn't equipped to even understand there. The mind can't go into that inner stillness, you see? So this is why we talk about like, melt into it, surrender to it, trust, yield, say yes to it, because that higher power is actually guiding all of it. And that's where the transformation comes. That's the thing that's running everything. It, it, it's the source of all. How does it not have your back? Uh, how could it not have your back? Yeah. You know? It's just developing trust in that though, isn't it? Because you oh, know, when yeah. people say just trust in it, then you think, well, but how do I? How, how, how do I trust something I don't even understand? That's right. That's right. And that's the spiritual journey. And that's why we have to walk there in our own shoes. You can't take anybody with you. You know, like, it's like going to sleep. You can go to bed with somebody, but you're actually going to sleep alone. Yes. Certain things we have to do alone. Um, and, and you can't bring your kids. You can't do it for your kids or your parents or anybody. It's like yes. you. Yeah, it's you going in there alone. It's a very intimate personal relationship. And this is why spiritual practice becomes important. You know, it's like, I just want to sit and be. And it's like, yeah, yeah, that, that quiet time, whether it's meditation or it's just time out, time to be. It's exquisite because it's like, 
parking the mind as best you can and resting in that zone inside because the more the more you give it space to show up in your life the more spiritually oriented your life will become not in a woo woo way but in an authentic present loving way it has so much to teach our human self your greatest teacher is inside you that's really your guru it's inside you you know um and so that relationship is there for all of us you know and just to add one thing in there if i can um you know it might be is that somebody is saying yeah but if i sit i just feel like crap i just feel depression or i feel awful sadness and loneliness and it's like uh huh so on the way in inward to that place of being if there are pockets of old memories layers of emotion that are buried the invitation is hey peel these off because that that exquisiteness is underneath it's underneath for all of us i mean it's just can't be removed it can't be but it can be eclipsed like a dirty wet blanket a dog blanket you know is <laughs> over it and hiding that inner light so like well what do you got to do to peel it off do you have to resolve something with somebody do you need to bring in more oxygen so that your body feels more vibrant do you need to, to go on medication to help you through a tough time do you need to see a therapist and cry like crazy do you need to write a letter to somebody who really hurt you and maybe burn it if you don't want to send it like what do you need to do to peel back the layers of pain that can disguise that inner exquisiteness yeah and that's there's a whole area to explore there because often um emotions are repressed you know people get people get the idea that oh now i'm on a spiritual path the only thing that i should be feeling is peace and joy so if i'm feeling something other if something else is coming up i must be doing something wrong so i think you know i think to to be really open and honest about about having to feel your feelings having to allow space um it is really important yeah um, and this is mm -hmm. and this is kind of one of the the problems with traditional spirituality you know the over emphasis on bliss and love and joy um and and that worked for a couple of thousand years to kind of preserve the teachings you know and to to put a carrot out there so that people might want to become more spiritual and it was usually well join a religion and then we had all the crapology that's there with religions you know the controlling aspect of them so there was this whole political um agenda that has doctored the scriptures for 2000 years that's there the message though is pure and it was held the humanness the human experiences and the the blind spots of great spiritual teachers were not they were removed from scriptures they were removed from biographies they were removed thank heaven they lift they lift in the bit about the bible about jesus getting angry but for most you know in in the market wasn't it or something they yeah, were in the temple the money changers the money well done that's exactly it <laughs> thank heaven they, they they left that in but most biographies and teachings have removed these examples of where our great masters were human because that was seen and understood by the people who were editing to be less than perfect and this is the great flaw of scripture where there was no guidelines on how humanness is an exquisite part of our divinity So it's only now in this era of transparency and openness and where we're finding our voice where we're saying I I can't suppress my humanness if I do there'll be a dysfunction. You know it's only like 50 or 60 years where we have the word psychology. You know we're only just learning how to not repress. And an awful lot of the humanness was repressed. So go away to an ashram, go away to a monastery and shut down that stuff. 
I was going to say that that's that's what people did, wasn't it? They that's what they, they did. They, they wanted to pursue a spiritual path, so they went. They, they became a nun or a priest in that's the Christian right. religion. That's right. Or they went off to an ashram. That's right. Sat at the feet of the guru and never really lived a, what would be called that's a right. householder's life again. That's it. That's it. And so suppression was advocated within those structures. Avoidance was advocated. And so now we're saying, oh, so, so my humanness is legitimate. It's more than legitimate. We're at the, the cutting edge of rewriting what it means to have a spiritual life. And it has to be while you're rearing children or you're driving a bus or you're a barber or you're a shopkeeper, whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, that's not the obstacle. But we don't have good signposts yet on how to integrate your humanness. This is why your podcast is so important. How do we integrate your humanness without any supporting documentation? We're learning as we go. But our kids, the next generation, will have our experiences and the books we write, you know, as templates and models to adopt and do better and do better and do better. You see, we're really changing the face of spirituality. It's a very exciting time. Yeah. What, so mm -hmm. what, how, do, how do we honour both our human, hum, humanity and our divinity? How mm -hmm. do we even begin that process? We've got to be brutally honest. We have to have a pretty good level of self-confidence in ourselves. Doesn't mean being out public, you can be, be very much an introvert and, and have self-confidence. It means knowing that there is beautiful worthiness inside you. Because if we're playing, you know, at being unworthy and that's our normal way of, of going about it, then, then we're not going to be able to be robust enough, honest enough to see, oh, that was a little bit screwed up, huh? Because if your confidence isn't in place and we do something that's a bit screwed up, we will use that to make ourselves feel worse. What, what we do need is that honesty and, and uprightness and maturity in ourselves as human beings to go, oops, I screwed up. Okay, I need more information about what really went down there. I need to understand why did I screw up and I need to make amends. I need to, I, I need to make this okay. I was completely a jerk and I need, I, need to, I need to do better. And so being able to engage with our own shadow is absolutely essential. Now, I've seen spiritual teachers who teach shadow work, but will not do their own shadow work. So we're really at the very start of this of like, no, it's all about shadow. It's like, so who supports you on your shadow? Oh, I have my team, but my team is within my organization. There's nobody outside telling me what well, the, the organization has a shadow because the bad practices are being passed on to the people in your organization. That stuff happens. Like that happens a lot, a lot. And so th there are various layers that we're only just beginning to learn that can be um, supported by mechanisms. Therapy is one, but you know what? If our inside relationship with ourself isn't in place, all the therapy in the world won't do it. Am I prepared to be vulnerable? Am I prepared to be open? Am I prepared to see my own less than perfect side? Am I prepared to know that there is no perfection at all, that this human experience is about evolution. There is no arriving at being the perfect human or the perfect divine expression. This is the growth and evolution and change dimension. There is no perfection here. Stop even imagining that it can be here because it, it's, the perfection is that it's imperfect. That's the perfection, is that it has to be imperfect. Otherwise, there's no opportunity for evolution. And the human race would stop. If there was perfection here, we would stop. We would reach our potential and it would stop. And no, this, this opportunity is always giving and changing and growing. So make friends with imperfection. Are you totally prepared to be honest with yourself? 
Are you okay about being vulnerable and open with at least one person? Are you prepared to like let it all hang out? When you speak about your own shadow side, can you be objective or do you go into guilt and shame? If you go into guilt and shame, what you're doing is you're going into trauma. You're blaming yourself for it. Stand over it. Allow your beautiful human imperfection to be seen for what it is. An opportunity for learning, for growth, for alchemy. So we've got to change completely how we relate to our humanness so that the hiding stops. So in your bio, one of the things that, that I read was that you're a co-founder of the, remind me of its name, the Association, Association for Spiritual Integrity. Uh -huh. So talk to us about what spiritual integrity is. I'm sure the answer is very similar to what you've just said. Yeah. But what, what is spiritual integrity and how in the with the teachers that we're involved with, with the organizations we're involved with, with, with just the things we come across in the spiritual arena, how can we discern for ourselves whether spiritual integrity is there? Oof, great question. Spiritual integrity, you know, the word integrity comes from wholeness. So it's about this united, embodied, honest awareness of all the components that, it, that, that, that show up in a human being, you know? And so if that is whole, then there's no hiding. We're not compartmentalized and splintered off. How that shows up for spiritual teachers is reflected in how they use the power that they have in the role of a teacher. How do they use their power? Is it used respectfully? Well, is there, is there willingness for the person, the teacher to be a student also? Are they also learning? Are they being responsible for themselves? Or are they somehow getting off on the power? Are they denying their own shadow? What's going on there? Are they open to feedback? Is there an opportunity for for me and I do I feel safe in being able to say I, I don't like the way you responded to that person over there who asked the last question it, it to me it seems like your attitude was a b c d I welcome this this needs to happen to where there is this ongoing open transparency so that the authority of the priest and the rabbi and that, you know, it's a patriarchal structure, not always gender based, but the structure, the traditional structure that have brought, brought spirituality this far has this infallible deity who does everything. Here's the idea of perfection again. But of course, it's not. The idea of perfection allows shadow and pain and abuse to happen. So the Association for Spiritual Integrity is a member organization, it's totally voluntary, it's anybody in a position of spiritual leadership who wants to be accountable for how they show up at work. And so we sign up to a code of ethics. There is an opportunity there for all of our students, no matter, I mean, it's spiritual teachers in the non-dual and we have rabbis and we have Buddhists and we have a coven of witches who are all spiritual leaders and, and tarot card readers and these are all members all wanting to use their power well and respectfully. And there is an opportunity then for anybody who is a, a client or a customer of that spiritual leader to make a complaint and say, no, they didn't keep to these aspects mm -hmm. of the code of ethics. And we take that up, not as a policing organization, because that's more of the patriarchy. What we do is like, okay, look, some wonderful opportunity here to see, is there some shadow side here? Was it a breakdown of communication? Was it a misunderstanding? Or is there an opportunity for growth and learning here so that we become better at what we do? You see? So it's really about changing the culture, changing the agreements that we have with our spiritual leaders. What we expect from our spiritual leaders, we want it to change because we want to deliver something much more authentic and honest and open so that the teachings can be um, more pure, less, 
an opportunity for scapegoating and bypassing. Yeah. We want to walk our talk. Yeah, wonderful. Um, another another topic that I wanted to discuss with you is the role of the body in spiritual awakening, mm. because. Often that can be an area of spiritual bypass. You know, people get this idea that, you know, I'm not my body. And so that kind of gets translated into, well, I don't need to, to think about it. And in fact, it's a nuisance and in the way of my spiritual progress. Yes. So from your perspective, Jack, what's the, what's the role of the body and how do we include the body in our awakening? Yes. Yes. And I fell into that trap on my own journey. There was a few years of my body's not important. It's just a, a vehicle to allow the awakening happen, but it's not important. And that shifted when I did some really deep healing stuff with ayahuasca and San Pedro. And I had to use shamanic medicines to support the breakdown of the limitation in my thinking. The limitation was my body's not important. That was the limitation in my thinking, but I thought it was really helping me because yes. uh, I read it in lots of places. And, and I thought, okay, my body is actually an illusion. This is not important. This is like, get that out of the way. So, so that was not true. It wasn't true at all, actually, you know, um, it helped me to, to, run ahead I suppose and understand more from an intellectual perspective but I was simply postponing the work in my body that's all I was doing I was parking it we've got to come back into the body totally come back into the body and this is oh there's many things I could say about it I suppose for myself I, I know that it took me a while to come back into the body I had discovered that my body had tensions and patterns that were old stored stories. I had crafted a way where, where I could function with, with, with pretty good clarity. And these things were so well packaged away, I could ignore them. But when the body starts, like you've got to pay attention to this vehicle, but what's it doing here? I fell in love with my body, mm. fell in love with it. And so even now, like the teachings now, I very much talk about we have to manage our own needs on every level. And if we manage our own needs, then we don't project it. We can mature. We don't project somebody, our needs onto somebody else. And this very often is the root of conflict that we have with other people is that we're not taking care of our own needs. So we project it onto somebody else. They don't even know what we're arguing about because really we haven't even faced what we're arguing about because we needed something else that we didn't even recognize within ourselves. You know, and very often if we can tease out an argument with somebody, we're like, this is actually what I wanted you to do. It was actually about something else. We might all have examples of that as like, oh, my God, I was actually like something entirely different is what started my attitude that created that fight, you know, and like here it is. Here it is. We're not comfortable with what are my needs and we have to be in our body to know what our needs are because our body will tell us what our needs are. Our body will. Physical needs are some of it. If you don't get enough rest, you're not going to be clear. You're not. If you don't get enough exercise, if you don't move your body, you're probably going to be supporting an awful lot of, of freeze from trauma. It'll stay in your body if you're not moving your body. You know, it's like, I got stuck. I couldn't do anything. The guilt, shame is like, come on, move it, move it, move it. So this body is this vehicle for transforming, which is just beautiful. And you know, also like the, 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 a change happens in the brain for an abiding awakening. We stop using our, our self-referencing network, the part of our brain that makes everything about me. We stop using that part as the dominant feature and we, we become objective. It kind of, feels kind of like being in observer mode. And that's in the neuroplasticity in our brain. Like there's a awakening is in the friggin' body. We're going to ignore the body. The yeah. very thing that's going to have the transformation in order for awakening to happen, we're going to ignore it. It's central. It's central, you know? So, so, so weave it in, weave it in, take care of it, love it, fall in love with it. 
Don't judge it. Don't need it to look like or be like anybody else out there. Just as your spiritual practice, don't make it look like or be like anybody else's out there. Your path is yours. It's uniquely yours. Love it exactly as it is. You know, that which put it here made it exactly as it is. So, but the mind wants to reject everything. So we've got to train our minds totally love it. However, it's showing up today. Totally love it. Let's work from there. Because dropping into the heart and resting, that love has to go penetrate every cell in your body. It's got to be okay in your body that there is love for your body. Let's start there. Yeah. And then- and So then, important to hear that, so important. So important, it's baseline, like non-judgmental, exquisite love for your body. That's the foundation for embodying, embodying your awakening. You know, being grounded, being here, keeping it real. Yeah. And, and there's there's two parts to that as well, especially for women, I think, you know, that just the, the physical part of many women have a very troubled relationship with their own body and with food and with all, with all of that stuff. Yes. And it's seeing that the spiritual awakening begins to heal that part but also the other side I think of this is something that you know I've been exploring myself is how the body clears itself in order to contain more light I don't know if those are the correct words but perfect it's wonderfully yeah. explained yes yes I'm certainly feeling feeling that I love how you said you have to come back to the body I think it's just like how you have to come back to the world as well yes. that's right that's in right. order to integrate and yes. yeah we can't have... dismiss anything you know we really yes. can't dismiss anything you know um it, 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 it like how, how can we compartmentalize people, activities, you know, and then the internal stuff, a part of my body or part of my past, how can we dismiss it and come to wholeness? How can we dismiss it and really understand the unified field, like really know the unified field, the interconnected of everything, if we have compartmentalization going on within our own personalities, beingness, body. You see, it, it, the wholeness and the yes, bring that into, yes, bring that into. And, and to integrate as we go cultivates absolutely essential spiritual maturity. Mm. You know? Yeah, and what, what's occurring to me as you're speaking is um, often the, the spiritual path can become very intellectual and mm. just in the mind or just in... Mm in I don't even know the word mental realms perhaps yeah. but but very heady say. yeah yeah so and this you know what you're describing is is to really bring it into the body into life totally to integrate it so that we leave behind that you know I hear people in you know I'm the community manager for Evolve the Teachers of God Foundation and uh, membership program and often I hear people say oh I can't keep up with the assignments or I've not done all the reading or so I, I don't quite know what I'm, I'm getting at here I'm just feeling there's something here the the moving away from this intellectual learning I've read about it I've listened to people like you I think oh I want this how do I how do I get it bringing it out of the intellectual realm into embodied life, living a spiritual embodied life. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you know, I, I'm not sure why I'm making so many Christian um, references today, but here comes another one. You know that Holy Spirit thing where there's like a halo? No, no, it was a flame on top of their heads. Some kind of, some kind of, I don't know, there was some ceremony or something and the Holy oh, Spirit. Oh, that was the, at Pentecost. The Holy Thank Spirit you. came down in flames. In flames, on, on uh -huh. top. Yeah. On top. And we have a halo, which is like the imagery, imagery for uh, the crown chakra being open. The halo was the connection to the divine. So it was the crown chakra. 
the Christian, you know, the Christianized yeah. version of, of the in Indian anatomy of the spirit, which is our chakra system. And it comes down from the head down. That's where it comes from. So it shifts our concepts, gives us a, oh, makes our attention go inward. And it, it makes us be more silent because mm -hmm. it kind of zips up our mouth a little bit. If we talk too soon, if we, if we don't let it cook inside us, it can't go beneath our, beneath our neck. You see? Mm. So if we, if we yap, so a teacher is like, oh, uh, you know, my friends say that I'm teaching them. I should be already teaching. It's like, okay, when was the last big transformation? Oh, six months ago. I'm like, stop talking, zip up, zip up and let it come into your body. There's an energetic component that comes down and many never let it go beneath their neck. That's a real thing. That's a real thing about it coming down. And so if we start talking too soon, teaching too soon, we will be disembodied. And there are teachers out there who don't have an embodied awakening and their stuff is, is toxic, toxic, um, but very much guru, guru talk, you know, about being infallible and I'm perfect and I don't make mistakes. And it's like, yeah, you have, just haven't got into your body. That's what that sounds like. You see? And so when you go into your body and find your humanness, you got to go through each chakra system. If I go back to the Indian reference, you know? And so the throat chakra is like, is where judgment, criticism resides. The heart chakra, how do I love? What's my understanding of love? Down to the solar plexus, who I am as a person. Like my will, have I surrendered it to personal will? My second chakra, how do I do sex? How do I do intimacy in my platonic and sexual relationships? Like your, your, the other part of your second chakra, competitiveness. Have I turned competitiveness into cooperation? How's my relationship with finances and what supports me? All second chakra stuff, base chakra stuff, you know, security, solid, connected to the earth. Am I okay with me? Is there an underpinning? I'm not safe, I'm not safe. That's base chakra stuff. And so the embodiment, the grounding has to clear out all these issues which are in our chakra system, in our physical body. If we don't do it, that part of our body will be depleted because the chakra will take energy from your organs. That's the spiritual to our health connection. That's mm -hmm. where that shows up. You know, and I know I said earlier in this podcast, if I didn't do it, I'd get sick. That's yes. what I was talking about. Yeah. That connection is was always kind of alive for me. And it took me years to recognize it as, an, oh, my God, my lumbar issue had to do with that. Oh, holy Moses. OK, mm -hmm. I dislocated my right hip in the middle of my leaving cert. And in Ireland, the leaving cert is the exam that tells what university you're going to go to. Or like it, it's kind of like, do you go to third level or do you not? And which one do you go to? Um, in the middle of my exams, I dislocated my my right hip. And my right hip like popped it out in the middle of doing some farmyard work. So I was there on crutches, you know, doing my exams. And like, it's about competitiveness. What is any school exam about except competition? Uh, so, Jack, as I mentioned earlier, um, I am the community manager for Evolve. And our teaching series is the Integrated Awakening series, as you know. And you're going to be our featured teacher in July. Um, so the topic that you're going to present is give yourself permission to screw up on the spiritual path. So tell, tell us a bit about that. Why did you pick that particular topic? And what might people who are coming uh, learn and experience in the three live masterclasses you will be giving? I would like people to understand for themselves how, how the belief that awakening makes your life perfect is not true. And how the way you view your life is quite different with awakening. And that changes your relationship with it. And as a result, suffering doesn't happen so it's more of a consequence it's not that oh my life would be perfect and all nice stuff happens it's like no shit still goes down but how you see it how you respond to it is in 
completely different. And so suffering rarely happens, rarely happens. I'm, I'm reluctant to say never. I don't want to make any promises because that was the, that was the, the, the trouble that got us in here in the first place, you know, in terms of scripture. Well, I can give a really personal example of that because as I told Wait. you before we stopped, started recording, last week I had COVID. In fact, I'm still COVID positive as we're recording this. And I didn't care. <laughs> I didn't... You know, I watched the body go through its thing. I was quite unwell at points in the week. And I just, I didn't suffer. So That's it. There it is. There it is. Yeah, my body is sick and am I okay? Yeah, like, am I, am I okay? Or am I like really pissed off and totally in my head? Or if you really investigate and if there is that inner space cultivated inside, you're always okay. And no matter what, no matter the hell that's in front of you, you're still okay. And so I suppose there is that fine line between being disembodied and you're okay because you're actually left your body. But we're emphasizing being in your body, totally authentically. I'm here in this body. The experience of my body is having of COVID right now. It's not easy for my body. I'm going to support it and love it and take care of it. And I'm actually fine. I'm actually fine. Yeah. Yeah. you know it's beautiful yeah. perfect yeah. example yeah. yeah and 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 it's a legitimate position when we learn how to use our mind in, in, in a different way and we do, when we discover the authenticity of what's really inside you know yeah. and so on that course for people to recognize how that works for them and what are the shifts that they have to make in order to be able to view from a different lens of perception view from a deeper one you can always plug back into your human suffering if you want, but you'll see that it's limited and it's contracted and it's learned and it's conditioned. And, and why would you go there? <laughs> you know, so so that's the first thing really is like pull back there, understand how you can still get caught in a me, myself, I story. And, you know, the mind is tricky. So the mind will say, oh, but you lose out all these things. Like life will be bland and boring because nothing will really throw you. Oh, no. Experiences then will be just like, no, don't you want to just engage and feel alive? And it's like, OK, that's the mind. That's the mind saying, hey, mm. I'm your friend. I'm your friend. Come on, like stay back in here, believing that you are a person and separate an individual. But of course, it's just a belief system. It's not the truth. Um, and there is a turning point of that we all have to reach, which is actually believing my mind, no matter how attractive my mind makes it, it always leads to pain. That's a huge turning point of like, no, no, I don't care how wonderful it promises to be. It always ends up in pain. And it does. It does. And so with that inner movement within ourselves, now, how do you manage and how do you deal with crap that comes up? What are your avoidance strategies? Do you avoid conflict? Do you, what, do you, what do you avoid? What do you run from? How are you around being called out? Called out? How are you around being less visible, about being misunderstood? Do you have skills that you need to learn in order to manage life in a way like what are the new skills you need to learn so that you can manage life in the awakened way rather than going back into the habits and the conditioned responses that your brain is so familiar with? And that's a real shift. That's the shift I want to talk about. It's like you're going to go back into the conditioned responses unless you learn new skills, unless you learn how to view life in a different way. You know? We have that horrendous war going on where Russia is just being totally obnoxious to Ukraine right now. And yet it is love for Putin. I am called to surround him in love because he's, mm -hmm. oh my goodness. I understand so well how much fear of love there must be for you to need power, for you to need power to feel alive, to have that experience. What experiences are you moving away from that you're craving power so much? 
You see, we're all human. We all have walked this to some degree or another. What are we moving away from and compensating with and hiding from? What, what is it inside us that is the most painful? What is it? And let's develop our own hmm, skills and level of honesty where we can hold ourselves, love ourselves, because your divine being can support the broken parts of you. We actually are quite self-sufficient here. It's really useful to have different therapies at different times for a leg up, it's really useful. But at the end of the day, there are certain steps that we have to take in order to be awake and aware 24 seven. And so that's what I wanna talk about is, is like, hey, let's look at the pattern of history. Let's look at how we need to make the, any biases and opinions that we've bought into around spirituality as a fix on and I'll be perfect then. Let's break them down. Let's chuck it. It's bullshit. It's bullshit. It's a lie. It's not true. It's simply not true. And so if we can see that it's not true, okay, what does that mean then around how I navigate forward on my own spiritual path? And that's what I'd like to help people to navigate. It's like, well, how do I manage this then? How do I make friends with imperfection, the perfection of my own imperfection? And, and how do I respond in a way that, that is wholesome and in integrity? How do I use my power properly? How do I step forward and be more honest? And how can I be vulnerable and open and be safe mm -hmm. and let that light shine regardless of what's happening? That's what the masterclass will cover. Yeah. Excellent. Really looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. Because integrating our spirituality is the work of becoming a fully mature human. Yes. That the world so desperately needs. Desperately needs it. Yeah. Yeah. So that is, we're having three live masterclasses, June the 11th, not June, July the 11th, July the 18th, and July the 25th, um, 90 minute masterclasses live with, with you, Jack. So really looking forward to that. And I hope that our conversation today has given people a flavour of all the types of issues that will be addressed and that they can come to work on. There'll be a chance for Q&A with you. Um, and so um, I really encourage people to check out the link in the show notes uh, for more information about Jack's masterclasses and how to join us in Evolve. So um, any last words, Jack, what would you like to leave us with? Keep going and don't look back and you're going to fall a gazillion times and you will get up again and welcome a time, if it's not here already, welcome a time when you are happy to fall, to trip when over you yourself, to make a boo-boo, to make big mistakes, little mistakes. I, I Genuinely, I love when I screw up. I love it because I know I, I will become clearer, more authentic as a result of it. It's only my own blind spots. It's not life treating me unfairly. It's my own blind spots. And I want them mm -hmm. to be exposed to me for my own growth. So it's all about me at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> evolve and grow and and there is an honoring of that this jack person honors that inner movement to grow i i i, I kind of get it you know within myself i get it it's like yeah and there's this conditioned machine called my brain and my body is holding a lot of the biography of that i'm sure i'll always be healing myself i, I always want to be healing myself o otherwise I, i've lost the plot somehow you know, and so so I welcome where I screw up because that's where the alchemy happens. And so so I want people to welcome the fuck ups. 
absolutely absolutely well it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today can't wait to spend time with you in July I'm sure we're going to have a blast and learn so much and integrate and embody our spiritual awakening yes. at whatever level that is oh for yeah 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 thank and you so much where it's at is the only place it can be at and that total honoring and acceptance of how our path is unfolding th yeah. that's important to like stop comparing it don't be comparing yeah. to anybody else no your path can only be the way it is love it be with it honor it yeah. you know yeah. thank you so much jack thank it's been you lovely. Susan. thank you yeah thanks for the opportunity i very much appreciate it thank you very much bye-bye bye-bye